Matt LaFleur with Kevin Clark last week at the league meetings. And Chris, it's something you say all the time, the running back. And it's one of the reasons why we're advocates for the running backs to get paid more. They are the baddest of the badasses on the team. They're the guy that's almost as fast as the fastest guy and almost as tough and scrappy as the toughest and scrappy guy. They can do it all, and they do it all. And maybe they could beat everyone in a race and kick everyone's ass at the same time. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, Aaron Jones, what he's doing. I mean, again, I think if most people saw Aaron Jones in person, you'd be like, what? This is the guy that's running between the tackles and bouncing off the Micah Parsons and Fred Warners of the world, right? It's not going to be like, oh, wow, look at this specimen. I mean, that, that, that's the amazing thing. It's incredible speed. It's incredible strength for 190 pounds and an incredible durability to add on top of that. Like, hell of a football player. And, yeah, I mean, his best days might be behind him. But, damn, in that offense there in Minnesota, whoever's playing quarterback, we know that O'Connell can draw it up as far as throwing the ball down the field. And then you got Aaron Jones underneath in the pass game, the screen game, and, of course, the runs. You know, that's the type of formula we talk about all the time when you uh, great offenses make you defend every part of the field. And that's where Minnesota will be a pain in the butt for some defenses this year. LaFleur also addressed this notion that yeah. he really didn't know it was coming, that the Packers were going to embrace Josh Jacobs after five years in the NFL and a lot more wear and tear over the past five years than Aaron Jones and cut Jones loose. Here's LaFleur explaining his surprise when he found out that the front office was making that change. It kind of caught me off guard too, to be honest with you. I mean, certainly I knew that there was, there was, yeah, and I mean there was there was some other things in play, obviously with with Aaron Jones, and um, I didn't quite know how everything was going to go, and it just happened um, really fast on that Monday. They came down, and um, when they were allowed to start to talk to those guys, and um, yeah, it just it happened really fast, so. I don't know all the, the details of that. I, you know, I'm not involved in, in those types of conversations. That clearly wasn't with Kevin Clark unless there were a lot of rude people who showed up and, and <laughs> decided to start talking and filling in the we'll shot. Give, I have a we'll feeling give that Kevin was, Clark the uh, – we'll give him the pub anyway. That, that was the breakfast. That was the breakfast availability. But uh, it, it it's surprising, but it's kind of not. I mean, look – he said enough there where he knew there was an issue. Yeah. They were due to pay Aaron Jones too much money. I said this yesterday. When Jones said after the Packers 2023 season ended, the future is bright, my first thought was you're not going to be part of it. And, of course, I dared to make that observation, and everybody told me what an idiot I am. And, you know, they never tell you that they were wrong when they said you were an idiot. They just remind you when they were right that you were an idiot. But when they – they tell you you're an idiot, and the thing you said pans out. They never come back and say, very sorry, rarely. we were the idiots. That's, that's very rare. But it was that massive salary yeah. that had to be dealt with. Right. And I assume, unless they misplayed this badly, I assume whatever the Packers were willing to pay Aaron Jones is less than the one year seven million dollar deal he got from the Vikings. D yeah, I, I I would I would think so, definitely, right? And, and again, maybe there's a little bit of a personal aspect too of like, wait, I'm your guy, you drafted me, I've been here. Why are you always looking to me to, you know, trim the fat off the salary cap or whatever else? Right. I think it does get a little personal, more personal when it's the team you've been there your whole career and you feel like, wait, they're asking me to take a pay cut? Almost like the 49ers with Eric Armstead, similar type of situation, right? It's like, wait, I've been here, I've played all this good, and damn, it's one year where it's not perfect, and now you want a pay cut? And, you know, guys do get uh, annoyed or it gets personal when it gets into those type of situations. But yeah, the, the Packers structure, as we see, it, it's interesting. It's not exactly like, you know, a lot of other teams in football, you know, and I think so even more maybe than the normal team where, yeah, the GM and the front office call the shots as far as player personnel and all that. And this guy coaches the team. 
It, it, you know, again, like LaFour said, he's aware, he knows, but he's the, they don't involve him in, in the details there. So he knew there was something going on there. But I think that was a little bit, hey, to, to LaFleur, what happened with Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love thing. I think that was one that was kind of similar. Like, wait, what? We're taking who? Okay, whoa, whoa, okay. I'm, we're going to open up a can of worms in, worms in my life here. And he deals with it. But uh, interesting nonetheless. And, you know, Josh Jacobs, of course, different type of runner, right? A little bit younger, not much younger, but definitely a bigger, thicker, in-between-the-tackles sledgehammer that's a little different than, than Aaron Jones' style. We made this point yesterday, though, what made the transition from Jones to Jacobs even more surprising, the idea that they didn't go younger. They didn't draft a guy and yeah. then move on from right. a veteran. They got guy with a lot of wear and tear and a lot of mileage to replace guy with a lot of wear and tear and a lot of mileage who is expensive 12 years or, f- or not 12 years. That would be a long contract. Four years, 48 million, 12 million a year. That's what I meant to say. But the way it's structured, they can get out of it after one, one year. year. They'll pay him right. a lot for one year, but they can easily get out of it after one year. They don't guarantee money beyond the first year. They're one of the few teams that does that. And, you know, you look at this idea that the coach isn't always in the loop. And I want to say that's dysfunctional. Yeah. But maybe it's not, you know, and this is a product, I think, right, of not having one owner that the coach can work on over time. An owner that will be smitten by the coach who, what, he won 13 games every year for his first four years. You know, there are coaches who will come in and leverage success into power. That's what Belichick did. Belichick didn't have all that power when he showed up in New England. He, if you've watched the Dynasty series and, and remember those days, he got more power the more successful he was. There are coaches that will try to grab control and authority, and they become the guy who's in charge of everything because they've won. That's one of the ways it happens. In Green Bay, there isn't that one person you can go to where it's going to make a difference. You can go to Mark Murphy all he wants. Mark Murphy can't change the structure of the way they've done things forever. They've got the CEO, they've got the board of directors, the coach is the coach, the GM's the GM, the front office does what it does, and the coach, to a certain extent, is a bystander in all that. The coach just has to see what they what they give him. Now, it would be dysfunctional if the coach's attitude was, well, you gave me that guy and I'm not going to use him. I'm never putting Jordan Love on the football field. I'm never taking Aaron Rodgers off the field or whatever the case may be. Matt LaFleur is not like that, and that's probably one of the reasons why they hired him. They don't want to hire somebody who's going to come in and try to upset the system, but this is a product of the way the Packers always do things. Yeah. And I think it's it seems weird to us because elsewhere, a coach who's been that successful wouldn't be Caught in the loop. Guard. He right. is the loop. Right. He is the loop. Right. Right. They want they want to your point, I think in, in a lot of organizations that are set up like let's just say the the hey, the GM, the front office, the head coaches, coaches the team and all of that, right? A lot of the times the front office wants the coach, needs the coach. They want him to sign off on the player. Hey, hey, we're thinking about letting go of this player. We're thinking about signing this guy or this guy. We might do this tomorrow. Coach puts on film, blah, blah, blah. Ooh, yeah, okay, hey, I like that guy more than this guy. If we can make it work with the money or whatever else. that That's what seems different about Green Bay is sometimes that that doesn't even happen. It's a little bit just like, hey, you know, we might do something with Aaron Jones. Hey, we did something with Aaron Jones, uh, LaFleur, and we signed Josh Jacobs too, just so you know. And it's like, whoa, that's what it kind of seems like in Green Bay. And then to your point, I think in a lot of, you know, especially the – the organizations where the owner is in the building, right? And it's maybe, okay, the GM's in control of the team, the coach coaches the team, but the owner's in there. The owner can be a little bit of that liaison, right? The coach can get in his ear a little bit like, hey, they they want to get this player in free agency and uh, I don't love that. Like he's got this issue and I talked to this coach on the other staff and they said he's a jerk and whatever else. And now, like you said, the owner can go up there, like you always say, and kind of make his thoughts be known or blah, 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 or try to bring them together in a conversation. And that's what's different about Green Bay. It's just done a little differently than, than a lot of teams. And I hear you say that, and it's like, why the hell was Aaron Rodgers surprised that he didn't have a seat at the table? The head coach barely did. Like, <laughs> right. the, you know, the head coach is just like, there's your team this year. 
good luck. Well, why would the quarterback think he has more juice, more say, more influence than the head coach? But that's just the way they do things in Green Bay. And does it work for them? They're competitive more often than not. They've had a string of three great quarterbacks. Have they won enough championships to justify the presence of those quarterbacks? Probably not, but still, they are competitive and relevant every single year. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.